Hi, I'm Carl Malden, and uh, I'd like to talk to you about American Express. No, hey, it's me, Jim Gaffigan. Um, I'm wearing a hat because I didn't shower. Since the pandemic started in March in New York, I have been doing commentaries every Sunday on CBS. Well, not every weekend, but I've done 16. 16. We thought it might be fun to post all of them in one video. I'm not saying you have to watch them, but in the description below is all the different ones. So if there's one that you missed and you want to check it out, or if you want to see me slowly losing my mind, or just nostalgia, take a look at what we've all been through. Uh, the most recent one was last Sunday, and then it goes back in time to March, which in a lot of ways, we're still in March, aren't we? Anyway, feel free to hit subscribe, uh, suggest it, uh, like it, or whatever. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna shower. Some people would shower before they do a video, not me. Anyway, I love you a lot. It's already August? But is it really? I mean, the calendar may indicate that it's August. The weather outside might feel like August. It's beautiful. The corn I planted would make you think it's August, but is it really August? Wait, I planted corn? It can't be August. There wasn't a July or a June or a May. There was definitely an April. I remember April. It felt like a cruel extension of March. What if we're still in March? It could still be March. I'm still doing the same thing I was doing in March. I'm still only hanging around these people I call my family, like I did in March. I'm, I'm still dressing like I'm struggling with a hangover, like I did in March. I still don't understand how those Zoom meetings work. I still watch the news frustrated and flabbergasted like I was in March. I still don't understand that term new normal. Like I didn't understand it in March. How can something be new and normal? How can something be normal and new? I gotta check my corn. This is all mine. That's why I know it's not March. Cause I'm growing corn and why am I growing corn? What's your job like now? The reason I ask is because this CBS Sunday morning thing isn't my only job. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love doing these segments, but like many of you, I have a couple jobs. Well, I had a couple jobs. See, in addition to doing these things, I'm also a writer and an actor. Well, I was an actor. Then again, during the pandemic, I've been acting like I'm not going crazy. <laughs> My main job, or my day job, is actually a night job. I'm a stand-up comedian. Because when you have kids, you lie to them all the time. You're like, you wouldn't like this ice cream. It's very spicy. <laughs> For the past 30 years, 300 nights a year, I perform stand-up comedy. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I've performed everywhere. Clubs, bars, laundromats, theaters, arenas. I even performed once at a rodeo, because I have a good agent. But then boom, COVID hits. Getting groups together during a highly contagious pandemic is not a good idea. So what's a comedian to do? A comedian needs an audience. Stand-up is a conversation. There's no fourth wall. Sure, the conversation's kind of one-sided. Only the comedian has a microphone and the audience communicates by laughter, but it's a communication. The laughter of the audience is not just enjoyed by the comedian, it's enjoyed by everyone. There's a sense of community that's built. Can stand-up be performed virtually via Zoom? I suppose, but nothing beats the in-person experience. But how? Well, last Sunday, in the parking lot of a horse track in New Jersey, I performed my first drive-in stand-up show. This is my first one. That's right. I performed stand-up comedy to close to a thousand cars. People were sitting inside the cars or socially distanced on top of their roofs. Was it ideal? No. Were the laughs as loud? 
Definitely not. But it was a show. And for a couple hours, through my jokes, and through the flicking lights and the faint laughter and the beeping horns, a community was built. Did that community look like a traffic jam? It sure did. But I'll take it. I'm sure it wasn't your most social 4th of July celebration, but at least you got to participate. I learned a long time ago that I don't need to be in a group of people to eat too many hot dogs and hamburgers. And if you aren't social distancing with fireworks, you're going to get hurt. I would say 4th of July is probably my least painful calendar notification I've received during the pandemic. Like many of you, I have notifications on my computer of upcoming events. Back in March and April, many of those events had to be canceled because participating in them would mean death for someone. Unfortunately, I didn't remove those events from my calendar. As a result, every couple days, I receive a reminder of what my life could have and should have been like. Ding! I was going to perform at Radio City Music Hall. That's not happening. Oh well, my career's over. Ding! Oh, that's right. I was gonna fly to LA to work on a movie that would have changed my career. Now, that's never gonna happen. Ding. Ah, our family was gonna do our annual summer beach vacation. Well, we had to cancel that. And since it was Corona, even the insurance we got didn't cover the cost of the rental. I ate the whole thing. That's a reminder, I'm definitely going broke. Ding. Looks like we're not attending the family reunion this year. Yeah, I guess it's not all bad news. As things begin to open up or reclose, depending where you live, either way, I have a confession. I secretly thought this pandemic thing was going to be kind of easy for me. See, at first, I thought the quarantine was going to last two weeks. So I was a little off. I was a little off. I also assumed quarantine life would be relaxing. I like how none of this hurt until Patrick got on. <laughs> Wrong again. Wrong again. Now, before you think I'm a fool, which I am, you should understand my logic back then. You see, in early March, in New York City, when there was rumblings of a possible order to stay home. In place order. There was part of me that was like, so they want us to stay home. Okay, I can do that. I don't know if you can tell by looking at me, but shelter in place is kind of my go-to anyway. I'm what you would call indoorsy. You know, you have to understand, I've been working and traveling nonstop. When I go out to eat, if I order a salad, the waiter's always like, "Oh, <laughs> Look at you try! Doing what I love, but my life had lost some balance. I viewed a lockdown as a time to regroup, maybe rejuvenate. I thought spending time with my family would be helpful. It wasn't, and it, it isn't. But what did I know? Back then, in early March, when we were finally issued the orders to not go to work, to stay home, and in the case of New York City, not leave our apartments. Remain indoors to the greatest extent. I was like, whew, this is going to be easy for me. This is my wheelhouse. And then when I found out ordering delivery could help small businesses, I was like, I'm going to be the king of the pandemic. Anyway, my point is I was wrong. Yeah. And it's not the first time I've been wrong, but it's probably the last. Did you know that the number one gift that dads want on Father's Day is a phone call from their children? That's right. Not a tie, not a book, not a bottle of booze, not barbecue equipment, not even one of those ugly and personal world's best dad coffee mugs, which by the way, no dad wants. 
47% of all dads just want a phone call from their children. You know what? That makes sense. That's all I want. See, if I got a phone call from my children, I guess I should explain. I've spent the last three months with my children and only my children. That's 101 days of quality time with my kids and only my kids. I mean, who, who's keeping track of time? If you're playing at home, it's over 2,400 hours of just them. If they called me on Father's Day, that would mean they wouldn't be around me. I wouldn't be able to hear them scream and complain. And Well, if they called me, I would know they were calling and I would let the call go to voicemail. And then I would text, sorry, I can't talk right now. Call you in five minutes. But I'd never call. That would be the best Father's Day ever. I'm kidding. Kind of. Happy Father's Day, everyone. Call your dad. Especially if you live with him. Last Monday was Memorial Day, the unofficial start to summer. To some Americans, not only was it the start of summer, apparently it was the end of the pandemic. Now, most of us would agree we're not through this yet, but where do we stand? Is this the middle, the end of the beginning? Is there gonna be another wave? How many waves? Do I need a surfboard? We could look to history for hints. The Spanish flu of 1918, which some scientists think started in Kansas, sorry, Spain, that had waves. The second being the most deadly. I don't know what that information gives us, except for more fear. The irony is not knowing what comes next is what makes life interesting. But still, it would be nice to know where we stand. Like if you go on vacation, remember vacations? Depending on the length and the destination, you could figure out how to pack for that vacation. Of course, this is not a vacation, but whenever we travel back to normal, wherever that is, we're gonna wanna be prepared. Either way, I should find out if any of my pants still fit. We're all in this together. That's one of the things we were told, right? We were told, you know, wash your hands every 20 minutes, stand six feet apart, wear a mask, stay home. But remember, we're all in this together. Are we? Well, as a result of following those orders, my hands hurt, I'm lonely, and I essentially have the social life of the Unabomber. In some ways, we really are all in this together. I mean, this is a global pandemic. Yes, in other countries. They're cheering on their healthcare workers and slowly losing their minds also. As a country, we're all in this together. And the emergency is over. I don't know about that. I mean, the virus has hit different parts of the country at different times. and. We all know different socio and economic and racial groups have been affected differently. Heck, I don't even know if, as a family, we're all in this together. Gotta take screens. Why? My kids. Because eventually I gotta take them. When I take their screens, I don't feel like we're all in this together. I'm gonna take that. Why is it so short now? And my wife, you know. How are you doing? Let's just say she hasn't liked me for a while. And I see her point. Maybe when they said we're all in this together, they were talking about the voices in our heads. <sighs> you know, it may surprise you, but I have many voices in my head. There are the two loudest ones right now are the one that says, we're all gonna be fine. And the other one is, we're all gonna die. 
Of course, both those voices are wrong, but those two voices and me, yeah, we're all in this together. You can do it, me. You can do it, me. Thanks, me. Thanks, me. You can do it, me. Thanks. Uh, me? I don't know how much longer I can do this. Unprecedented. Remember when hearing the word unprecedented was rare? It was something special. Something people would say to sound dramatic. The unprecedented devastation in Australia. The hurricane caused unprecedented devastation. The unprecedented outbreak of a mosquito-borne illness. I used to be frightened, a little excited when I would hear the word unprecedented. This is a really almost unprecedented big snowstorm. Ooh, something's unprecedented. Well, that's never happened. Mixing things up, are we? Now the word unprecedented bounces off me. Breaking news, unprecedented job loss. Unprecedented measures taken to shut down the country. There could be, quote, unprecedented illness and fatalities. Like most of you, I just want to go back to the times of precedence. I miss the good old days when politics was boring and business news was a snooze fest. I want to go back to a time when I had no idea what an epidemiologist was. We live in unprecedented times with an unprecedented number of sick people and an unprecedented strain on our healthcare workers an unprecedented level of unemployment, and an unprecedented number of Americans seeking food assistance. To me, the struggle to find hope and gratitude in these times is unprecedented. I have so much to be grateful for. My wife survived a brain tumor. Can we do the totem pole? My children are healthy. Wait, what about Jake? Well, well physically. I should focus on gratitude during these unprecedented times. See, unprecedented events are now the precedent, not the president. Although the president is unprecedented, which is now the precedent. Wait, how long have I been in here? Who's the president? Well, this is my eighth weekly commentary during this time of quarantine. Eight? Can you believe it? Who knows, maybe in a hundred years, someone will watch a couple of these and think, wow, during that pandemic, people really got pale. <laughs> Kidding. We all know the world won't last another hundred years. It's day one billion of quarantine. I do appreciate the opportunity to check in and do something besides stop my five children from trying to kill one another. Your face is so red right now. Ah! And the cleaning. Oh. I had no idea how exhausting it was to watch my wife clean all day. Who left the can in the bathroom? Another creative outlet I've engaged in during the shut-in has been having Dinner With My Family streamed on YouTube every night. Welcome to Dinner With The Gaffigans. I'm one of the Gaffigans and we're having dinner and you're invited. It started as a silly show where maybe we'd invite people in who are separated from loved ones or people that wanted a break from the news. It is the evening report. I'm sure some people just watch so that they can see children with uncombed hair eat food prepared by a man slowly losing his mind. What if I told you guys I made this pasta by hand? Ugh. But I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> Pretty quickly, we turned the show into a fundraiser so that we could raise funds for the front line and to help out the food insecure. Brigitte Lugo gave $2. Thank you so much. It's not much, but it's something. The biggest surprise of Dinner with the Gaffigans is that we've done 59 of them. 59. That's right. That's more than I've done of just about anything. I dreamed of Dinner with the Gaffigans. 59. Most television shows, like CSI, whatever city they're on, they'll do maybe like 26 episodes. We've done 59. A chicken patty. 
And you know how much I've been paid? Nothing. I need an agent. Be safe, everyone. We're here to make you laugh again. See you next time on our show. Okay, it happened. I've been in quarantine in my New York City apartment with my wife and five children for what now? A hundred years? Okay, fine, it's only been seven weeks, but it finally happened. I miss other people. And I'm not talking about my friends. Obviously, I miss my friends. Not all of them. And I'm not talking about people who come to my shows or follow me on social media. Obviously, those are good people with excellent taste. No, I'm talking about the other people. The strangers. The people I don't know who I haven't seen for seven weeks. You see, living in an urban setting like I do, other people or strangers are an integral part of my life. I can't walk down the street, ride the subway, or pick up my kid from school without interacting with strangers. Pre-pandemic, I wasn't a fan of strangers. Strangers seemed to be in the way. Strangers seemed to be a burden. Now, I miss them. You know that person at the airport who decides to only start looking for their ID when they're standing in front of the TSA guy? I miss that person. I miss the people I would see in my neighborhood once a month. The lady with the enormous dog that certainly wouldn't fit in any New York City apartment. I miss the guy in the fashionable green overalls who, whenever he would see me and my oversized family, would sneer at us. Maybe he wasn't sneering. Maybe that's just his expression. My point is, I miss community. Humans, we are social animals. I don't need a hug. I need a sneer. I look forward to the day. One of you can sneer at me. Have you seen the news? I mean, all the news. Because I have. That's right. I've seen all the news. All right, fine, I haven't seen all the news. But over the past six weeks, when I'm not preparing food for and cleaning up after my five vandals, I'm watching news. I'm watching news, reading news, like I'm cramming for an exam. Jim, can you come help me with homeschool? Jim, can you help me with the laundry? I'm almost embarrassed by what I considered news prior to this whole pandemic. Remember when Harry and Meghan moving to LA was considered breaking news. They've announced they're stepping back from their royal duties. Well, this is really their own sort of Brexit. I guess those were the good old days. And I watch everything. All the shows, all the coronavirus town halls, the mayoral briefings, the governor briefings. My daughters are getting tired of my jokes. Believe it or not, how that can happen, I have no idea. Even those presidential briefings well, some of them. I'm not a masochist. We've done this right, and we, we really, we really have done this right. I've seen the same infectious disease expert on multiple channels. Joining me now is Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Anthony Fauci. It's like I'm stalking them. Let's just say I watch enough TV to know that Sanjay Gupta's schedule is ridiculous. Oh, Anderson, this is, this is inexcusable. I mean, it, it's just inexcusable. I've even gotten to the point where I'm watching BBC News, the news of our cousins across the pond. The Prime Minister has announced the most drastic limits to our lives that the UK has ever seen in living memory. I don't know what it is about BBC News, but I must find it comforting. Maybe it's knowing this is happening to someone else, or maybe I just think the British accent is a little less panicky. 
The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, said this is a sombre day that reinforced why the public must adhere to social distancing rules. Or maybe I just like the opening of the news program where there's just the world spinning and there's no sound and then suddenly it's done done like it's an episode of law and order bum bum but mostly what i've realized by watching bbc is that we're not in this alone this is not america's pandemic or this is not europe's pandemic this is a pandemic affecting all of humanity we're counting on you nerds to solve it. Go science. Please. Thank you. Five weeks. Five weeks in quarantine with my wife and five children in our New York City apartment. And I'm not crazy. <laughs> I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. Did you hear an echo? I'm not crazy, crazy. crazy, but I'm getting there. Every morning I wake up, it feels like that scene in the movie Groundhog Day. Okay, campers, rise and shine, and don't forget your booty. Rise and shine, rise and shine. Oh, nuts. Except unlike Bill Murray's character, it's not Groundhog Day for me. It's January 1st. Who does that? After a New Year's Eve party that I wasn't invited to. Now come over here. Look at this. Every morning, as I walk out to greet my true friend, the coffee maker, I see the remnants of some phantom party. Who does that? Who would do that? A can, a wrapper, some crumbs strategically placed to invite mice or bugs that's wrong that's mean was it you no it's my children they're vandals they're doing it on purpose to torture me that's the garbage that's the juice box garbage juice box you just have a can in your bed why would you think that would be okay um, I don't know. I don't know. I was gonna throw it away. They destroyed an antique chair. They didn't break it. They destroyed it. It's my boys. They're savages. <laughs> my wife and I have tried. We've tried to civilize them. We, we tell them how to sit, how to eat, how to comb your hair. Now, when's the last time you guys combed your hair? That was a pretty yesterday. Long we comb their hair for them, yet they still look like this. This is your hair, right? I should go. I can hear them planning their next mess. I'm not crazy. You're not crazy. Now I'm talking to my fly fly phone. Hang in there, everyone. Hi, I'm Jim Gaffigan, and I used to do stand-up comedy. I used to write, and I also did some acting. But now, I'm a professional shut-in, living with my wife and five children in our New York City apartment. The daily ritual of cooking for and cleaning up after five children seems cool. Well, it seemed cruel until they started their distance learning program. Distance learning. <laughs> How do I say this without cursing? I'm going to remind you, I've made comments on a lot of your work. Go back and check. If you've never heard of distance learning, that means you probably don't have children. Or you're a worse parent than I am. You can also write, you can also say cheating in two sentences, right? Like. Watching. For students, they get to go to school, but don't get to be with their friends. For teachers, they get to teach, but only to a screen. Just write a message to me and I will get back to you. And for parents, we get to fail at tech support and class monitor. I can't hear anyone. I can't hear anyone. I can't hear anyone. Though. All right, that's all right. We have five children 
on five different devices in five different parts of my New York City apartment with five different schedules that happen simultaneously? Sounds fun, right? Well, it sure is. My wife has created elaborate color-coded schedules and charts to manage when online classes end and others begin. There's usually some drama with every change. <laughs> The great irony of distance learning is that it occurs on screens. Make sure that middle finger's all the way up. Screens, the great enemy of parents. Parents are always trying to get the screens away from their children. But during quarantine and during distance learning, you give them the screens and then you take them and then you give them and then you take them. It's fun, it's fun. If you don't know what it's like to take a screen from a child, just imagine you're trying to convince an addict to go to rehab. What are you doing? Nothing, I was just, I was just looking at it. It's not time. My wife and I just finally caved and bought a steel charging contraption that locks away the screens. Now that may seem extreme, but we've only had to change the combination twice this week. I guess, the point I'm saying here on Easter is we're having fun. Be safe, everyone. Here's some good news. It's springtime, everyone. Winter is finally over. Flowers are blooming. Baby birds are singing. Well, from what I've heard, I've been in quarantine for the past three weeks with my wife and five children. But so have many of you. I mean, not with my wife and five children, or with this haircut. Thanks, Jeannie. Of course, where you quarantine can provide a different experience. My brother Joe and my sister Pam are in quarantine in Chicago in their homes. My brother Mitch is in quarantine in Indiana. I have another brother Mike in quarantine in Orlando. I know I have a lot of siblings, it's annoying. My sister Kathy, is in quarantine in Mesa, Arizona with her boyfriend. She's been nice enough to send photos of her and her boyfriend enjoying Arizona's weather. Dinner with the Gaffigans, including your hostess who regrets agreeing to this. <laughs> me? Well, me and my family are here in my New York City apartment. If you've watched the news recently, you know New York City is the new epicenter. There are more cases in New York City than anywhere else, so, we're number one. To make things more interesting, my wife is considered high risk. You see, two years ago, my wife had a tumor the size of a pear removed from her brain. Here we are. The surgery was a success, thank God, but following that, she contracted pneumonia, which severely damaged her lungs. So, here we are on double secret lockdown quarantine. The big highlight of my day, when I'm not cooking and cleaning, is taking the garbage out or picking up packages. I call it my me time. But you know what? It's still spring. It's a time of renewal and rebirth, a promise of better things to come. Instead of being disappointed about staying at home right now, we should be thinking about the possibilities of the springs in the future. You know what? I can hear the baby birds singing and I see the leaves growing. And I don't know, it, I guess it gives me hope. Did that sound believable? Be safe, everyone. Hi, still here <laughs> with my wife and five children on quarantine in our New York City apartment. How is it? Good, good. Every morning we wake up and we eat and then we clean and then we argue. Then we eat and clean and then we argue. Sometimes we mix it up and we argue before we eat or clean. Essentially at this point, my wife and I are running a diner. We make mediocre food for ungrateful recipients. Then we clean up and do it again. Sometimes I imagine my family and I are participating in a never-ending episode of that long-running show, Alice. What's the soup de jour? Split pea. 
That was a soup yesterday, Jewel. I would, of course, play Mel, the gruff and grumpy short order cook, but you know how to heart of gold. Fill up the salt shakers. With salt? No, with uranium, of course with salt. My wife, Jeannie, would play the resilient and strong Alice, who's just trying to keep things going. Don didn't believe in insurance. How come? It didn't come in a six pack. My children would play rotating roles. When they were confused or befuddled by a situation, they would play Vera. Oh, Vera, lock up. How? If they're really sarcastic and mouthy, they would play Flo. Hey, cutie, where you been all my life? The first type, I wasn't even born. <laughs> and believe me, they say things much worse than kiss my grits. Mail. What? Kiss my grits. <laughs> Occasionally, they're sweet, so they play the role of Tommy, Alice's son. All right, now what if I lose? Then you've learned a lesson. Wow. <laughs> Never listen to a 12-year-old kid. Similar to the TV show, we work unrealistic shifts that start early in the morning and seem to end real late at night. The biggest difference between us and the real show, Alice, is our episode never ends. Anyway, here's the opening title sequence to the show about my life and quarantine. And in between I cooked and cleaned and went out Be safe, everyone. We're going to get through this. Maybe. As you can see, I'm here in quarantine. Or is it on quarantine? Either way, I'm here. And obviously, I don't normally look like this. Uh, the quarantine has kind of, you know, affected my appearance. All right, fine. This is what I look like normally. I've been here with my family in our apartment for six decades, six days, six days, dinner, lunch, breakfast. But you know what? I'm trying to use this time to reconnect with my wife and our beautiful four children, five children. They're one of them short. Honestly, in February, when I heard rumors about hypotheticals of us being quarantined, in our apartments and houses with our families, I, I was mostly worried about being bored. And then I heard Shakespeare wrote King Lear while he was on quarantine during the Black Plague. And here's what I've learned. I'm not bored. I'm not bored at all. Creative production, none, no King Lear. But you know what? I also realized that Shakespeare, probably if he was writing King Lear, he wasn't helping his family. He wasn't helping his wife, so really, we should look at maybe canceling Shakespeare. The second thing I learned is all these movies and shows about post-apocalyptic times were wrong. There was not enough emphasis on toilet paper in those shows and movies. I don't know what some people are doing with the toilet paper, if they're eating it, but some of those people should probably get some roughage in their diet. The third thing I've realized is I love the internet. Thank God for the internet. The internet has been an invaluable tool for communication and also for creative outlet. For not just me, but also my family. Dinner with the Gaffigans, dinner with the Gaffigans. Dinner Every night we do this Gaffigans. YouTube show called Rolling. Dinner with the Gaffigans. And to be honest, that show brings my family together and maybe makes us not kill each other. Anyway, I love you internet. <laughs> When did that article go up? And finally, I learned it's possible for one man 
to eat two weeks of food for seven people. You ate all our food? Um, don't tell your mom. Mom? Be safe, everyone. Hi, thanks for watching. Hit subscribe if you want. If you want to see more stand-up, I have more stand-up, or if you want to see an original show like Let's Get Cooking or The Mike and Pat Show, that's available on my channel. But also, just know that I'll be posting a new video every day during this pandemic or until the world ends. Please hit subscribe and turn on your alert or notification button.